Welcome back. <clears throat> Our first question. If design law stands firm and unchanging and is the way God sets forth the fabric of reality of which not one jot or tittle shall be changed, how do we understand then understand all the times that miracles occurred in the Bible record? These miracles are very clearly the fabric of reality bending from their natural state in quite unnatural ways. I understand God has a right to do what he wants with his creation, but it just seems a bit inconsistent uh, when understanding the law uh, as design law. It, it depends on how you understand whether God has somehow made design law and set it free, or whether, as scripture says, all nature is sustained, is made by him and sustained by him. And there are elements of his sustaining power that are beyond our full comprehension. And so I don't view any of the miracles you see as God violating his design laws in any way. He is still operating within those design laws to bring the miracle about. Um, we, we can do things today operating on the laws of physics that if we were to go back in time would appear miraculous to the people at that time. And to do those uh, things, well, whether it be uh, having a laser um, hologram show up in, 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 in the room or a voice that is projected through some type of you know, radio signals. Think about the radio signals that we can, uh, and television signals and cell phone signals that we can send and communicate through. This would be miraculous, and people wouldn't be able to figure out how that could be possible, but there's no breaking of the laws of, of, uh, of God's kingdom going on. So I don't ever see God breaking his laws. I see him working on a le level and layer beyond which we're capable of fully appreciating. I think Adam had capacity to do pretty much everything that Christ did prior to his fall. Adam was given dominion over the, over the planet. If you read in things like Patriarchs and Prophets and other places, he had conversation with nature in ways that we cannot understand. I think that we are very weakened in our sinful state. Uh, I, I think I don't have time to go into quantum mechanics and quantum physics. Uh, I've done a talk on that before, but there are connections that we have um, that, that God has built into the fabric of reality that all reality are connected through. We might think we're disconnected, but we're not. We're connected, and, and, and it's sustained through God's life-giving energy that, that flows from his throne out through all creation. Ellen White actually describes this as, as uh, the, the cords that ring through the harmony, and he touches every aspect of his creation through these cords that vibrate throughout immensity, she says. These are quantum strings that connect everything together, and depending on the vibration and the energy put in, it changes uh, physical matter, it changes everything. So I, I don't see God violating his laws. I see him operating on levels that, that we can't currently operate on. Uh, I believe that when we have a new heaven and a new earth, you'll, you'll have capacities within your being to operate on some of these energy frequencies. For instance, uh, Moses coming off the mountain, his face radiating some type of light. Um, this is an energy source that we're not fully familiar with at this point in time. But I don't believe it's a violation of God's design. I think it's exactly how it's supposed to operate in his uh, eternal kingdom. And we will all have that kind of light shining through us. Let's see, the, the person, there's a person that made a suggestion regarding a sharing track. Uh, that person, to be aware, I'm working on a new publication. I don't know when it'll come out, but uh, it's going to be along those lines. What is the purpose of the investigative judgment if Christ died for all of us? And this would go right back to how you understand the law. I would tell you, if you'd like a real deep dive in this, if you want it with Adventist references and historical documentation, then go uh, to our website and type in investigative judgment, and you can download a PDF. Uh, you can read it online, the, the Investigative Judgment for the Modern World, and we go through the symbolism and explain what it means. If you want something that's a really good sharing resource to share with people who are not familiar with Adventist resources and don't want those historical quotes in there, then get the, um, the, the, the wedding of Christ to his bride, the cleansing of the church, preparing for the second coming. That teaches the same truths, but doesn't uh, use any of the historical references and doesn't use Daniel 8.14. It's not really necessary. This, this same truth is taught in multiple different metaphors and symbols in Scripture, and, this, and, the, and the cleansing of the bride is also the cleansing of the sanctuary. It's the same. It's the same cleansing. It's cleansing the people. What's the sanctuary? What's the temple made without human hands built out of, according to Scripture? Don't, don't you know that you are stones built together into a house for the Lord, and so forth and so on? He's cleansing the people from sin to bring us back into unity so that we can stand in his presence again. And so what's the purpose of that? Well, what's these language investigative judgment leads to a certain legal way of seeing things, but it doesn't have to. 
What does judgment mean? Does judgment mean just something judicial? Or if you are presented with a conundrum and you have to make a choice, do you have to make a judgment about that? Oh yeah, well that, that's not a legal thing. That's something I have to decide. And in this great controversy, do we have a judgment to make? And who do we have to make a judgment about? God. Whether we trust God or not. And, who, and, who, and who's been, who is the primary source of Satan's lies? Who's been lied about from the beginning? And who must we come to understand the truth of? God. So we have a judgment to make. We, and, we, and how do we make that judgment? Are we to investigate? We investigate the record of Scripture, investigate what God has revealed to us in science and nature, and then we're to make a judgment. So the investigative judgment uh, can be understood very clearly as God, and this is what, and we describe this and, and, and make the case for it, uh, and this is what Scripture is teaching in Daniel, that uh, the, uh, the man of sin is warring against the people of God, the church, and is winning until judgment is given to the saints given, imparted, until we have the capacity to discern the difference between the lies of Romanism and worshiping the creator, and then we make a new judgment, and we stop worshiping a Roman dictator, and we start worshiping the creator, and we've investigated the truth for ourselves. This is the message of what the investigative judgment. It has got Christ working through his agencies to free our minds from the lies about him so that we're one to trust, and he heals our hearts and minds. That's the simple view, but I break it down point by point in, in those two documents. It seems like the new buzzwords now is it's not a salvation issue. In using this statement, do you think it diminishes God's instructions? Is there any biblical explanation of truth to this statement? So f to me, this isn't new. This has been around my entire Christian experience. Somebody will have a disagreement and somebody will say, that's not a salvation issue. Uh, that those words in and of themselves, it depends on how you're using them. They can be used like Pontius Pilate did to Jesus Ah, what's truth? Yeah. As a way to blow off any investigation and shut down the conversation. Ah, it's not a salvation issue. It could be used, well, what is the truth? I'd like to know. Can you explain it to me? Uh, that's not a salvation issue, but I want to know what salvation issues are, so what are the salvation issues? So it really does depend on how it's used, whether this is obstructing the advancement of the gospel or assisting it. If somebody ever says it to you, I would suggest that you just flip it right back and say, well, you're, you're, we only want to actually deal with the important salvation issues. What do you understand the salvation issues to be? What does salvation mean? How is one saved? What's the problem that the plan of salvation is designed to, to deliver us from? And you'll get immediately into questions of the law. Because most of the problem is, well, it's the wrath of God. It's the punishment for sin. It's the death penalty. After Adam sins, uh, the law required death. Somebody had to pay the penalty. Jesus is to, is to this is where they'll go, almost always. Rarely do they say th something like, like, the human species was changed in Eden. God wasn't changed. God's law wasn't changed. Humanity was changed and became dead, terminal, dying. And the plan of salvation, salvation issue, is to participate in what Christ has provided to restore us to unity with God so we can live. I rarely ever hear that. So, so it's a great conversation. If you're ready to, ready to handle it, flip it right back on. What do you understand salvation issues to be? What are they? And you'll usually get a legal accepting the payment that Jesus made in your behalf, so in the heavenly records you'll be declared to be just, righteous. So, uh, let's see. Sometimes I feel so wearied by all the sorrows and sadness in the world or feel so sorry for children that are not born into loving, caring families, families, but I was born into an amazing family and I honestly have a pretty great life. Am I wrong to feel guilty that I have it so good when so many uh, uh, others are so many others are facing so many struggles and suffering. I praise God for what I do have, but just feel terrible for those born into unfortunate circumstances. Well, it's an interesting, because you've kind of got this last statement, I feel terrible for others. That's empathy. That's compassion. That's sympathy. That's, that's righteous. Jesus felt that same towards others, and, he, and it motivated him to help and to seek to bless. But you said in the middle, am I wrong for feeling guilty? Yes. 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 If you're feeling guilty because you've been blessed, there's something wrong in what you're thinking about your blessings. And, and, and it, it, guilt, appropriate guilt, is from doing wrong. Inappropriate guilt is from believing wrong. Appropriate guilt, actually doing evil, will convict you and you'll feel guilty and you repent from that. But inappropriate guilt, when you feel guilt, but you actually haven't done wrong, it's because you're believing something wrong. And you need to examine, well, why do I feel guilty for this? And you might, it might only simply be that you're confusing empathy and you're feeling, quote, guilty 
Be, and the, here's, here's where you're believing wrong. Because you're feeling responsible and helpless and powerless to fix somebody else's life that you'd like to fix, that you care about. And I see this a lot. That guilt is like, I, I feel guilty because I can't make it better for them. Well, that's a lie. It's not your job to make it better. Jesus couldn't make it better for Judas. Our responsibility is to govern ourselves in harmony with God's principles and calling for our life to the best degree we're capable and leave other people free. That's our responsibility, not to take responsibility to fix other people's lives. We can't. It's clear we have a society that is declining in morals and values and even standards, but my question is why don't people want what's good for them? Why don't people want to follow a healthy diet so they don't struggle with health problems? Or why don't people want to, to uh, save themselves for marriage? Or why don't people want to remain sober and abstain from drugs? I recognize people have free will, but if I try to talk about some of these issues with people, they don't seem to want to hear it. So <clears throat> this question has a lot of extra nuance in it. There's not a single answer here. There's an assumption that people don't want these things. I've, I've dealt with a lot of people with addictions, and I really have only rarely, oh, extremely rarely, and I, there has been the rare occasion, I read about one, where the person doesn't want to be delivered. Most of the people that struggle with addictions actually want to be free of the addiction. They, 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 they don't want to struggle. They don't want to waste their money. They don't want to have this powerlessness and helplessness. They don't, they don't want it, but they don't know how to be free of it. And why do you think what may, might be the biggest barrier in their journey for freedom? Well, they go to the pastor, and the pastor says, Jesus lived his life perfectly, and he never took drugs. And if you, and if you accept the righteous life of Jesus in your place, you'll be declared to be drug-free and healthy, even though you're not. <laughs> You just need to believe that you are in the, in the sight of heaven. It's a, it's a fraudulent Christianity that tries to take away their guilt without actually transforming and empowering them to live victoriously. And this is why the 12 steps have been historically much more successful in helping people be free of an addiction than churches. Because the 12 steps, if you actually look at them, they're actually about bringing the principles into the inner working where they have to look inward and deal with the, what's going on inside the heart that leads them. And most of the time, people with addictions anyway, they're actually not looking to harm themselves. They're looking to comfort themselves. They're looking to anesthetize some emotional pain of some sort to feel better. They want to feel better. They want to feel better. That's what's really going on for most people. They're not wanting to harm themselves or anybody else most of the time most of the time. That's one reason. Another reason is because there's a lot of lies. A lot of people think they're doing what they're supposed to do. It's just not getting better, and they don't know why, they, but they're doing what they're told, and this is all they understand. They don't understand anything different because they've been told a bunch of fraudulent stuff. Yes? And I know people in marriages in which they were raised in churches, and I have had patients to come see me in marriages that weren't working well, and they weren't happy, neither husband or wife, but they were told by their church that the wife is to submit to the rule of the husband, and the husband should discipline and, and even hit his wife and beat her if she needs it, because that's a godly thing to do, and he controls and monitors the wife's behavior, and he must, she must get permission before she can spend more than the approved amount at the grocery store, et cetera, et cetera. This is a violation of the law of liberty. That love can't grow there. It's destructive. But the reason they're doing it is because their church taught them that wives are to submit to the control and authority of their husbands. They have, they have good motive. And, and, and I've had couples that have counseled with me, and I taught them the true principles, and their marriages got healthy. You can't, it doesn't matter if you have good motive. If somebody taught you that you will have better lung functions and, 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 and have better athletic performance if you smoke cigarettes, <laughs> and you're doing it because you want to be the best athlete you can be, and you really believe in it, you're not going to get better lung function. You can't have health violating the laws of health. You can't have spiritual, mental, emotional health if you're breaking God's design laws, even if you're doing it with good motive. Tim? Yeah. There's a lot of reasons. It, there's, there's also an aspect of how it's presented. Because um, I've, I've known people who, you know, just harped and harangued about, you know, eating to the point that I wanted to go, you know, find a giant bowl of ice cream and eat it in front of them. <laughs> um, 
So, I mean, there's... there's yes, they're making you feel like you're less than if you eat this or don't eat that, or, or con condemning or criticizing. Right, yeah. exactly. And I will tell you, that goes to the health message. I understand with the health message, it's principles of health, not rules. And because of the great wide variety of genetic differences between us, there are some people that actually have to eat some form of animal product or they won't be healthy because they have various genetic me metabolism issues that they need that. It's not our place to judge. It's the vegans that came along to uh, make the, ve the vegetarians feel guilty, you know. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we're going to want to, I'm a vegetarian. You guys are still eating fleshy foods. Huh. I'm a vegan. I don't even eat eggs or milk or cheese. <laughs> no, it's, hey, that's, I'm a vegan and we grow our own food. We don't even eat stuff processed in a can from Worthington or Loma Linda. So we're even more righteous and healthier. And then have a stroke the next week. And this person said, um, Happy Sabbath. Did Ananias and Sapphira, they died at the hands of God? Or did they die at the hands of God? It's up for debate, honestly. First off, that, thank you for that. First question, irrespective of the immediate cause of their cessation of life, whether it was directly caused by God acting or whether it was caused by the consequences of their action when God revealed his presence to them and it overwhelmed them, okay? e either way, they went to sleep. That's first death experience. First death experience is not the punishment for sin. Daniel, and you read about it in, I think it's Daniel 11 or 12, right there at the end of 11 and beginning of 12. God says, you're going to sleep in the dust and wait for the resurrection. Is Daniel being punished for sin? <clears throat> same death, same death experience for both. So even if, it, even if we take the, the hard position, God acted right then to put them in the grave. It's still not punishment for sin, it's something else. You say, you say well, why would God do it? What's the purpose? What's he trying to achieve? What's going on there? But that's not punishment for sin. Punishment for sin comes at the end of the thousand years. Even for the legalists who still believe in the penal judicial process, ask them, does God punish sin before judgment or does judgment come first? Well, the judgment hadn't happened yet. That was, it. if you're an Adventist, that was 1844 at least. So it can't be punishment for sin. So I'll leave you to, uh, if you want, I, you can look on our website. I've, I've written a little about that. <clears throat> My son and I were discussing the healing properties of Christ or the senses of twins when one passes the other somehow knows something has changed. Uh, do you understand what that meant? Yeah. That twins can yeah. sense each yeah. other long distance and one dies, that other one suddenly becomes aware something's happened? My son concluded that Jesus knew how to tap into what he calls the sixth sense or how Jesus would say if you had faith you could move mountains or could change the tangible aspects of life or you could take money out of the mouth of a fish. Uh, what was uh, Christ revealing in what seems to be his disappointment with his disciples that they didn't tap into this. I, I think this goes back to the question of the connection in our spirit. Spirit, and the, and the word spirit has many English translations to it. Panuma, which can be breath, breath of life, wind, spirit, ghost, as in the Holy Ghost. That's the Holy Spirit, the Holy Panuma. Uh, and, uh, and what does wind do? Jesus used the example, the spirit the wind blows, the panuma blows where the wind blows. You can't, you can't see where it comes and goes, but you can feel its work, okay? And what is the wind? If you think about wind as a metaphor, wind as a metaphor is energy, energy that you can't, that is ubiquitous around us all. It's, it's, it's here all the time, and it's moving in various ways. I think he's actually talking about the quantum strings that he built his entire universe to run upon that emanate from God and are sustained by God, and that in connection with those quantum strings, we actually, and we, we have quantum connections with the people. We've done experiments, and we've, we can document. You, uh, they did an experiment where they had two individuals get into a Faraday cage. Faraday cage is, a, is a, like a copper mesh cage that blocks all electromagnetic radiation, would be like radio ra waves and other frequencies from getting inside the room with them. Uh, cell phone signals and so forth can't get in. And they have them meditate for a, a few minutes together in sync with each other. And they have EEGs on where they're monitoring their brain waves together. And then they will separate them and put them in different rooms where they can't see each other, both in their own separate Faraday cages. 
So electromagnetic rays. And then they will take one of them, they're, they're still monitoring their brain waves, and they will shine a bright light in the eyes of one of them. And, and, and when, when you do this, you're monitoring EEG, and that light goes in, brain waves change in the occipitus. You can see the, the brain is registering the bright light. And of course, that happened in the person who's getting the light shine. You expect that. But it also happened in the brain of the other person who had no light shine into it. Their EEG showed the same pattern change once they sync, sync themselves. Okay? There's a quantum connection that is, is happening there. And, and the, more, the more we come to know somebody and are connected to them like identical twins, they have more genetics in common, more life experiences in common, more heart affections in common, more love for each other in common, then these quantum links are, are actually more entangled and thus, and mothers sometimes will have some impression that something's happened to their child, and this has been well documented. Part of that, I think, is the love for the mother. Part of it is when a mother gives birth to her child, some of the child, some of the fetuses, the newborn's child, blood and, and, and stem cells that were talked about a moment ago, transfer into the mother's bloodstream and become part of the mother's bone marrow. And for the rest of the mother's life, some of her cells will actually be the, uh, the, have the genetics of her child. And they've actually, um, actually biopsied brain cells of women. And uh, they found uh, neurons that have the, the nucleus of their child. And so of them. Um, so uh, there are connections that are here that we can't fully appreciate and comprehend. And I think this is what's happening and is how God built his universe. We're all linked in various ways. And yes? So my experience is working in an office, um, in a building with the same people day after day, every once in a while, we'll all come together with the same color of clothes on. Just, and, and there's been no communication, and we just look at each other and said, we're all wearing blue. Uh, well, how did that happen? You know, so it's kind of... And in nature, you see these quantum links. A school of fish, where there were tens of thousands of fish turn at the same time. Mm -hmm. there, is no, there is no explanation in normal communications that they all do, or, or the starlings. If you ever seen the starlings, where starlings were all, foul, tens of thousands were all do at the exact same time. Uh, these are quantum linkages and somehow we don't really fully appreciate with instant communication across. They've done uh, other studies on um, DNA confirmation where they will take um, blood samples from a person and then they will have an individual form in their heart um, the, the, the emotion of love and goodwill, feel, feel, generate love and goodwill, and then intend for the DNA in this blood sample to wind tighter. And that's what you pray for. You pray for or focus for that with love and goodwill. And, and they can measure that by shining light through. As the DNA gets tighter, it absorbs more light and so forth. So they can actually measure that just with a, with a light meter. And uh, they will have people do that. And then they will, uh, and, and guess what? When you, when you focus with love and good intent, uh, with, with, with love and goodwill, and intend to have the DNA conform, it, they have 30% increased light absorption. The DNA is, is changing, the, the actual struct shape of it, how it's wound, how tightly it's wound. They will then take it out of the room, put the person in a Faraday cage, no electromagnetics, so it can't be your brain waves. Take it five miles away into another building, and then have the person do the same thing. And the DNA confirmation is measurable and changes. And then they will have them just focus love and goodwill with no intention. Doesn't have any impact. Intention, but have another emotion, anger or something, no change. This is very important. What the data always shows, and there's lots of other studies that I go into that show this, this, this quantum linkages that we have. These are the linkages that God has created as universe to operate, and they operate upon love. When, and, and this is very powerful. Because if you have love and good intention and pray for somebody with intention, of, of a, you can have an actual impact on them physically, even if you don't believe in God. Does that mean there's no God? No. Let me, some people get real upset when I, and I present this data. Oh, you're saying there's no God. It's just our own efforts. No, I'm not saying that at all. Can, uh, there are the physics of the big things, and there are physics of the infinitely small things. We're talking infinitely small, but let's use the lesson from the big that you all can relate to. The physics of the big things would be the physics of friction and motion and pressure and so forth. So can a surgeon who denies, there is no, uh, denies God, he's an agnostic, an atheist, doesn't believe in God at all, can he still use the physics of big things to put pressure on a bleeding wound and suture it up and save a life? Yes. But he's not praying to God. He's not believing it. How can he do that? Because the physics of the big things still work, and he can use his own abilities to interact with the physics of the big things to bring a healing solution to bear. Now, if he prays to God and asks God intervention, we believe that God's presence will actually add layers of that, but 
He doesn't have to to still operate on the... Same thing with the physics of the little things. We can use the, our God-given minds, energy, love, goodwill to focus on praying for a good outcome. And whether we believe in God or not, and this is what the studies show, they take agnostics don't believe in God, they just teach them to generate love and goodwill and to focus with, with good intention to have a positive health blessing on this person. And then they measure that compared to others and you can see the positive blessing. They don't have to believe in God. It's a quantum linkage, good intention. But if you believe in God, I think you bring in another layer of divine intervention that is on top of that, just like the surgeon who believes in God can do all the physical stuff and also have God's wisdom and guidance guiding him. So I, I find it fascinating, and I think there's a lot we don't understand um, about some of these things. But uh, I think when we, when, when we have and walk the new earth again, you're going to discover that you have abilities that work on these quantum linkages, and you will be able to, I believe, this is my personal belief, um, walk on water, I believe Adam could have walked on water before his fall. I, there's very little doubt in my mind of that. Move with your mind inanimate material. Influence the growth of plants with your mind. This mountain to move. Tell a mountain to move. <laughs> Yeah, I think you'll be able to have some of this, this control, as long as it's not harming others. Well, the, the principles of liberty will still be at play. But you see some of this. You want to see an example? Satan became the prince of this world prior to Christ's victory at the cross. He was operating with some of the authority that Adam had prior to Adam's fall. And do you remember the temptations of Christ? Do you remember a, a temptation where Christ is suddenly at the top of the, the tower of Jerusalem, a uh, tower of the temple? Cast yourself off? How do you think they got there? Do you think he called an Uber? <laughs> no, they were in the desert. And next thing you know, he's at the top of the temple. How, do you think Christ performed a miracle, or the Father performed a miracle, or Gabriel performed a miracle to take Jesus there so that Satan could tempt him in the middle of the temptation? Whose power do you think put him there? Satan's, Satan's power. Some type of transportation we don't fully appreciate. I think we'll have that ability again. I think Adam had that ability. He could, I don't think Adam, uh, as the governor of planet Earth, prior to the fall, had to walk for years and years and years to make himself around the Earth. If he wanted to go somewhere, he could move himself there instantly. We'll be able to do that. Isn't it exciting? Mm -hmm. We've lost so much. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for your love. We thank you for the way you've created your universe. We pray so much to be brought back in harmony with your kingdom, your methods, your principles, that we can live them out here and now. We pray in your holy name. Amen.